the two sessions on uh, Muslims and biological evolution. Uh, we had a very, very interesting uh, session uh, a couple of hours ago um, with um, Dr. Shanawas and Dr. Salman Hamid. And uh, this afternoon we have Dr. Ehab Abu Haif and Dr. Fatima Jackson. Uh, Dr. Fatima Jackson uh, was scheduled to be here and um, her presentation um, is here and, and, and I will be going through her presentation including audio. Uh, she could not herself attend today because uh, she had to have surgery um, in the next couple of days I believe and so she is not able to travel. Uh, it's may go inshallah that she goes through that and inshallah will be uh, in good health soon inshallah. Uh, so, um, I will introduce uh, uh, first uh, uh, Dr. Abu Haif. Um, he's professor and co-director of the McGill Center of Islam and Science at McGill University in Canada. He works at the intersection of ecology, evolutionary, and developmental biology, and has made several breakthroughs on how genes and the environment interact between development and evolution. Um, using ant societies as a model, uh, he's uncovered the evolutionary importance of dominant genetic potentials. Uh, so with that, uh, I would also mention that his research awards include the Alfred Sloan Fellowship and the EWRCC Memorial Fellowship. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Abu Haif. Please come to the podium and give his presentation.
more than any time, biology is the future of and is the science of the 21st century. It is time that we take our own matters into our own hands, that we shape science, that we shape technologies, that we take matters into our own hands, that we are not told, that we move from being technology uh, producers instead of technology users. We largely depend on um, uh, Western countries um, and the West in general um, to produce uh, the science and we use it and we have to change that. And it's the youth here today that we must grapple with the difficult issues of evolution and the tough problems of science and evolution is only one of them. There are many to come. Cloning, um, um, cloning, genome editing, we are just at the cusp of many biological revolutions and we must tackle them now and we must try and shape the future. Um, and AMSET, ISNA, is just starting to help. We're trying to help with the McGill Center of Islam and Science and there are many other institutions and centers that are trying to take charge. Please get involved and please help us move forward. What I'm going to try and do here is just try and dispel, dispel some common myths about evolution. Same time present some of my own research. So, the first myth that we're going to try and tackle together is evolution is only a theory. Okay? And I'm sure many of you have heard uh, this uh, common phrase. It's a myth. Okay? What is evolution? Evolution simply, in the broadest sense of the term, is change over time. Cars can evolve, fashion can evolve, um, uh, hijabs, the fashion of hijabs can evolve, everything can evolve. That is a fact. But what we're talking about today really, the more difficult aspect of evolution, is biological evolution. And when we talk about biological evolution, we talk about descent with modification of all organisms <laughs> from common ancestors. The idea that uh, we all come uh, from a similar common ancestor, and that as things descend from those common ancestors, they become modified. Of course, it's always a bit more complicated than that, but this statement, when we talk about biological evolution in this sense, this is a fact. The evidence is for biological evolution, the descent from common ancestors of modification, is so overwhelming that it is essentially a fact that we cannot deny. Let's just start with the idea, of course, it starts with the very basic fabric that like a family, all of life is related. And we all share some aspects of genes. And if we can, in fact, with some genes, we can connect all of life. And if you just take a look, if you just have a, it's not to actually look at the tree, but basically plants, animals, and fungi are all related and even, to some degree, uh, to unicellular organisms, and so forth. Uh, this has been uh, shown uh, beyond any reasonable doubt. Okay, so then the onus is, um, we can't see genes, like we can't see evolution, but in fact, that everything we should be able to, the way we know these things, is we test them by experiment. And you should be able to, if things are all related, as I showed you in this diagram, then we sh the way we manipulate things, the way we experiment on things, the way we work with things in the lab should reflect this common ancestry. And I'm just going to show you a couple of experiments that show this. So here is a tree of animals, okay? And uh, here, I, I think you can't see the pointer, but basically this is these are all the documented animals that we know. The arrows point to squids, to flies, and the mouse. And I'm just going to tell you about one gene that's shared across all of these, the squid, the fly, and the mouse. This gene is called Pax6 or Ilus. It's a gene that controls the development of eyes. So basically, as a, an embryo is developing, this gene turns on and it controls the development of these eyes. Well, what we've shown through experiment, this experiment from the famous Swiss biologist, his name is uh, George Halder, and uh, basically what he showed is that 
you can take the copy of the gene from the human and you can inject it into a fly, a wing of a fly, and you can actually get, okay, a eye to grow on the wing of a fly. Okay, so what you're seeing there is a normal wing, and over here is a, uh, a, a, an eye of a fruit fly on its wing. Okay, but that's the mouse copy of the gene. Right? You do it, we've done it the other way around. We've put now the fruit fly copy, but not in humans, of course, we put it into frogs, and we can get the eyes of frogs to be to, to pop up on any part of the wing. Okay? If you look at these genes, these genes are extremely highly conserved. Uh, the just parts of this gene is highly conserved. There you've got the, the at the very top line you see Homo sapiens. There's the copy of that gene, the, the code of the amino acid code of that gene. And the dots essentially indicate similarity. So you can see across all animals, there's a high similarity of this gene at the sequence level. I'll show you some research from my own lab. These are ants, and it turns out that there are some ants. Uh, most, most ants and the workers, they all look the same. So I mean, most of the ones we have around Chicago here, they mostly look the same. They're all, you know, one worker looks the same as the other. But there's actually a species here in Chicago as well, uh, in which the worker force has diversified into not only workers, but they now have soldiers, as you see on the, on the far right, and super soldiers. These are the heads, and those big things you see on the jaws. Okay. Well, what we did in the lab is we knew that if we looked at the evolutionary history of this genus of ants, it's called Phygoli, and it's the most specious genus, the most specious genus of ants, there's, there's uh, more species in this genus of ants than almost uh, any other ant that's available, and also actually most other organisms. But what we know is that there's two occasions, one where it says P. Re on the top, you had the evolution of not only a soldier, but also a super soldier. And then later, uh, if you look down at another species called P. spinosa, also you not only have soldiers, but you have super soldiers. All the other species only have soldiers. What we discovered is if you can put a high dose of hormone at a very critical stage during the development, you can actually activate the development of a super soldier. Which means that again, the idea that all of life is related, everything, there's a continuity of genes, that even if things aren't there, you can activate those dormant genetic programs. And so we were able to go to species that don't normally show super soldiers, and we could induce them in any of the species that normally don't have them. Which means that they were there in the ancestor, they were lost, but the genes were still there, and we could activate them whenever we wanted. So this is very powerful. When you look at this kind of evidence, it's very hard to think as a Muslim. Um, you know, I heard some people in the audience in the last session say, those evolutionists, well, we're Muslims, and we should also be evolutionists as well, and we should conquer those challenges when faced with such evidence. It's hard to deny. Um, the uh, genetic continuity. So if, if that's fact, then what's theory in evolution? Because there is a theory part in evolution. Okay? And what's theory about evolution is that it's, you know, basically not all evolutionary biologists, we all know um, that, uh, that natural selection exists. We all know that there are different mechanisms, genetic drift. We all know that everything is related. But we, we argue about how things are exactly related. Okay? Some people say, this species is more closely related to this species, based on some parts of evidence. Another person will say, no, this species is more related to that species. That's theory, because we're arguing about it. It hasn't yet been established. We argue about what's the main, what promotes variation. Is it mutation, or is it the environment? There was a sister here in the uh, audience who said, yeah, but you know, there's, uh, what about epigenetics? You know, changes to the genes that are not actually in the genes, but through the environment. Well, we argue about that. Is that more important? Are mutations more important? Natural selection, sexual selection, artificial selection? Is it on individuals? Is it on groups? All of these things are very complex arguments, and we yet to have some agreement. Okay, so that's that. Okay, the next myth. <laughs> if evolutionary scientists disagree or argue, it means that evolution is not true. But I think, as Dr. Hamid had pointed out last time, disagreement is really part of the scientific method. 
Scientific method is based on testing ideas and generating data, making models and testing them and arguing. And it's only after a very long period of time where uh, these theories then eventually become fact. Okay. The next myth, again I only have 15 minutes so I'm trying to uh, partici you know, partition this as soon as possible, as much as possible. That evolution is linear, and I think this wasn't very clear in the last session, something that I think is so important and one of the greatest misconceptions of evolution, that evolution is linear. If you go to Google, and, I, and I, I, I welcome everybody to go home, and type into their computers evolution, the first thing that pops up is something like this. Okay? Who's seen this kind of thing before? Okay. Because this is basically, when you type evolution into Google, this is the first image that came up. But it's, it's been very difficult uh, because it's been misinterpreted. Because when you see this kind of image, the kind of thing that you get is that you have a, 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 an ape that then slowly transforms into a Neanderthal that slowly becomes into a man. A sort of linear transformation or transformation process. When I, uh, I debated Harun Yahya, uh, as part of the Dean Institute debate, they even had this uh, icon, icon as part of the uh, as part of the debate. But what I want to say is that you know we have to. Uh, this is actually wrong. This kind of iconography, this sort of idea that you can linearly transform from an ape into a into a monkey, to an ape, into a human. This kind of linear transformation is a mistaken. Uh, uh, is, is, a, is not accurate and is a mistake. And the problem is, it comes from what I call the curse of the scala natural. Now this is this idea of what's called the scale of nature. And it comes basically from Aristotle, and it goes all the way uh, from Plato to Aristotle, this idea that there's this kind of scale of nature, that some, you go from the inanimate, there's a literal transformation to the animate, Okay, and I can't see exactly, but I think I can show you on here, that basically according to the scale of nature, if you see the red box right there, you basically go, the, the, according to the scale of nature, you go from stones, right, composed of layers, fibers, and filaments, to truffles, right? That was the major transformation in life. That's how we came, according to the scale of nature, and then you go from then plants, to then animals, to then man. Okay? And so you can see here, you go from fungi to plants to animals. This is this idea of a linear transformation, which again is just, here's another way of, of showing it, a transformation from fungi to plants to animals according to the scale of nature. And of course, this idea of going from, you know, ether matter, air, water, pure earth, all the way to crystalline salts, to stones, to the truffle, right, <laughs> isn't... Uh, I, I think isn't a very realistic thing, it's actually wrong. You can't think about this way, this is a wrong way to think about evolution. This is the right way to think about evolution. It's the tree. You see that most people would be surprised to find out that in fact a plant did not transform into a fungi and it did not transform into an animal. But in fact fungi and animals share a common ancestor. And Plants and fungi and animals also share a common ancestor. And those common ancestors, the common ancestor between a fungi and a plant, was not a fungi and it was not a plant. Okay? It was probably some single celled organism that, when they split those two lineages, developed into fungi and then, on this hand, developed into plants. Okay? Uh, and developed into animals. So you had some common ancestor that was neither fungi nor animal that then split and then they developed along their own lines of evolution. So you cannot say, okay, that a fungi transformed into a plant, you can just say they shared a common ancestor that was not animal looking or was not fungi looking, okay? But rather that you probably had some at the base, some kind of single cell organism, and then in each of these lineages you had the evolution of multicellularity that developed into something that looks like a plant, something that looks like a fungi, something that looks like an animal. Well, you can apply the same logic to the gorilla, the chimp, and the human. Okay? You did not transform from a gorilla into a chimp and into a human. It was more uh, something like this. 
where you have the gorilla, the chimp, and the human all sharing common ancestors, but the common ancestor of a chimp and a human was neither a chimp nor a human. Okay? It was something that was similar in nature. We don't know quite, we're still trying to, the evidence is still there, we're still looking for it, but we don't know exactly what that is, and that is, uh, that's basically the major distinction. We are not, it's, evolution is not linear. Okay? So we can't say that Darwin's theory of evolution is some kind of linear transformation of monkeys into gorillas into humans. It's just simply not true. We all share a common ancestor, and we share a common ancestor all the way back through all of life is connected, just depending on how far you go back. Another tricky concept. Five minutes, good, we're still going. Five minutes, ten minutes, you know, we've covered a big uh, chunk of evolution. We've got five minutes to go. Okay, evolution is completely random. Who has heard this, that evolution is completely random? Put up your hand, okay? The idea is a myth, okay? And why is it a myth? So, the idea is that while variation, and this is even a debatable point, um, while variation is often random, natural selection is not random. Natural selection is a deterministic process. And humans themselves have mastered, we have taken control of natural selection through what we call artificial selection. Now we've been doing artificial selection, which is directed natural selection, on crops, domesticated crops, crops for a very long period of time. Um, some have argued against the theory of evolution because they've said, well, if evolution is random, if it's going controlled by random processes, it would take a very long, long time for random processes to be able to give rise to all the complexity that we see today, including humans. But in fact, in as little as 10,000 years, we were able to make something as the teosinte, which is basically the ancestral crop of corn, into something that looks like the modern form of corn we have today. We did that in less than 100 years. Okay? If you want to look at another example, you can look at the wild tomato, and we we're able to turn this into a domesticated uh, tomato in less than 100 years, because we've been actively selecting on uh, these through artificial selection. So selection, whether it's artificial or natural, is a deterministic process. It is not random. Okay? Myth. Fossil species are the same as modern species. Well, I'll go show you another exa example from my own research, which is the work we do on ants. And I'll just show you the most ancestral fossil of ant we know. This comes from actually New Jersey. It's called Sphecomerma freyi. This is an, a, a fossil ant that's been tracked in amber. Uh, and that's why it's kind of yellow looking. And why we think it's the most ancestral is because it has some mix of characteristics between wasps and ants. And bees, wasps, and ants are all thought to be cousins. Okay? And so here's a, a fossil that kind of shows uh, a little bit that relationship between wasps and ants. So ants are really just derived wasps. But what you can see is that since this fossil has been around for 150 million years, 150 million year old fossil, look at the now the modern form of the ant. It looks quite different. But I'll show you even some, I mean, you, you know, the problem is, at least me growing up, uh, going, I have my son in Amman, Jordan, and I just tried to show him some ants and almost like flipped out because, you know, the idea of actually going into nature and actually examining nature and looking at insects really got him scared because, you know, it's just not something you do as a child there. Uh, but when you actually start looking at nature, you see some really bewildering uh, diversity in modern form. So if you compare the fossil to the modern, look at this crazy ant. Look at that crazy ant. That's the head on that side. Look at this one. Isn't that crazy? Look at that. Look at this. Look at that. Okay? I could sit here. Did you ever know that there was a blue ant? I mean, it's just ridiculous. I bet you for the woman here, I bet you didn't even know there was a gold ant. Okay? Uh, and so, um, you can see that the, the what evolution has led to is quite remarkable. Even if you look at other fossils that are, this one is just, uh, if you compare the 150 million year old fossil to the 50 million year old, 50 million year old fossil, you will see differences. Diversity, even at the scale of ants, is remarkable in shape and form. And we have to be able to understand this because 
they have, there's a secret in there. They have something to tell us about the nature of life, especially since all animals share the same genes, as I told you in the beginning. Okay? So if we understand that, we can understand something deep, secrets of nature, uh, just by looking at something as small as the ant. So all fossil species are not the same. Another myth, and I'm, I'm trying to just squeeze in one or two more myths, that evolution is not equal to Darwinism. We often try and equate evolution with Darwinism. Darwin, of course, is one of my personal heroes. He was a pioneer in the study of evolution. He came up with the theory of natural selection. But the idea of evolution, as Dr. Chambas had, had been talking about, the idea that things can change over time was much older than Darwin. Darwin contributed a mechanism of evolution of many. And today, I just want to say that since Darwin's time, we have made remarkable progress. We've discovered DNA, we've sequenced genomes, we've elucidated gene networks, we've figured out that you can change, the environment can influence the way genes work, um, uh, we've cloned genes, we can even edit genes. And so the idea, this idea of, of, that Darwin had put forth, uh, that evolution should be slow or gradual, um, is not necessarily true. And the last, well, a couple moments. Do I have time for a couple minutes? Yeah. Couple minutes, yeah. Should I keep going? Yeah? yeah. All right, here we go. Traits are irreducibly complex. So some people have argued that essentially, how can you make something as perfect as an eye? And I could talk about this particular point for hours because there's even some of our own research on some insects that are very interesting. But the idea is some people have argued in the past, well, evolution cannot possibly create something as so complex as an eye. But again, if you look, and so the idea is, if you were to take the lens out, everything would fall apart. If you were to take the optic nerve out or the retina, everything would fall apart. So how possibly could you assemble something like this so perfect in such a gradual and slow process? But in fact, if you look in nature, you will find animals with all kinds of intermediate steps of trying to make some kind of eye, okay? That each gain. So if you look at, for example, flatworms, they have, you know, some kind of um, uh, pigmented cells with some photoreceptive cells. If you look at uh, snails, they have cups of eyes. Uh, then you have some other gastropods with lenses. And then, of course, you even have some fish with some starting to shape of these things. And if you go on, you can see that there's all kinds of intermediate shapes. Already, if you can at least sense light, that's already an advantage that you have in nature. So traits are not irreducibly complex. And finally, I'm just going to finish off with this idea that evolution and faith, uh, this myth that the idea that evolution and faith cannot be followed at the same time. And another myth that we often follow is that the creation account in the Quran is inconsistent with evolution. And again, this is something we can talk about for hours and we can continue with myself and Dr. Dajani during the, um, the panel discussion. But I'll just point to one surah, Surah Al-Nur, that I have here, and it says, of course, and Allah has created every animal from water. Of them, there are some that creep on their bellies, and some that walk on two legs, and some that walk on four. Allah creates what He wills for Allah, for verily Allah has power over all things. And from my own reading, and we can discuss this more, but I don't see any inconsistencies uh, between the Quran and evolution. Uh, one, I don't think that the Qur'an should be used as evidence to support evolution or even evolution uh, as a way of getting rid of the Qur'an. The respect for my mother, the respect for my son, the way I deal with tragedies in my life, I can't get from science simply. And I will not let people like Richard Dawkins, uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, take that away from me because that's not the purpose of the Qur'an. It inspires us to understand Allah's creation and I think uh, he's given us enough inspiration in the Qur'an to move forward and move into the 21st century. And with that, I end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abu Haif. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as, you know, in my opinion, you know, one of the foremost evolutionary biologists, not from the Muslim community, but from biologists, you know, everywhere is 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 a, is a leader in this field, and we're really we're very grateful that he's able to join us today. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Jackson is is uh, uh, 
uh, not able to uh, be here uh, not because of health reasons, but she has sent her presentation. And while I uh, get her presentation uh, switched on, I'm going to ask Dr. Iqbal Yunus, so we're going to have a short commercial break here, and uh, Dr. Iqbal Yunus is going to tell us a little bit about the organization that has sponsored this session, which is the Association of Muslim Scientists, Engineers, and Technology Professionals. Sessions, they have heard some of this before. But basically, I did mean, very quickly because uh, Dr. Jackson's presentation is very interesting. Also. The Association of Muslim Scientists and Engineers is a, I use this, other than. Yes. <laughs> but I think biology is where the 
frontier really is. I think uh, the technology, we've, we've been given enough time to figure that out. So let me see if I can turn the sound on. What I'm going to do is check the sound. Colleagues, um, I am very happy to speak to you today. I apologize that I'm not physically able to be at the Islamic Society of North America at this panel session. Uh, but I am grateful for the opportunity to share with you some of the contemporary signs of human evolution. Bear witness, there's no God worthy of worship. I love to make more humble since we're in this century. Just want to check that you could hear that in the back. Okay, but that's, I think as close as I can get it. So um, uh, we, we want to shut the doors, please, if you could. I don't know if that's possible. So I think there's enough sound here. Yeah. It's a very small room. Unfortunately, yes, it is small. In 40 minutes, we I don't want to change the technology right now because we've tried many things. You can just turn on this other mic and replace with everyone else. Okay. I thought that the speakers were all on. The blue mics. We'll go to the second slide. The first slide here is an important concept to keep in mind, and that is how is science done? Science is based upon observation and experimentation. With science, we create or modify a theory, but that theory has been the, based upon observation and experimentation. We use that theory to make predictions. And then the predictions help us design additional experiments to test the prediction. And this constant uh, evaluation of science is really critical. And that's uh, a modus operandi, a way of, of doing the work that is very alien to many non-scientists. And this is why it contributes to a real lack of understanding what we mean by the science of human evolution. Science is based upon observation and measure, as I said. We test disprovable hypotheses, that is, hypotheses that can be proven to be incorrect. Um, there's so much that is in Islam that cannot be tested by science. So science really just covers a small part of what actually exists. You have to be able to measure, you have to be able to see. Science is based on experimentation. Science generates data or evidence which is then evaluated by a diverse group of trained researchers. So there is no one person uh, that holds sway over a particular scientific perspective, they can be challenged, especially when they produce new data. The conclusions in science are subject to rigorous analysis, which strengthens science. And this is also in contrast to our dean, where rigorous analysis is sometimes thought of as weakening uh, one's faith. In, actually, in actuality, in science, rigorous analysis strengthens the science, and science is constantly undergoing revision. <laughs> this rather complicated slide um, positions human evolution within the tree of life. This is the framework for understanding the evolution of humans. From a scientific point of view, Humans are part of the natural world and are related to all other life on this planet. We share similarities at the molecular level 
at the subatomic level, at the molecular level, at the cellular level, at the organistic level, and at the organ system level, in terms of individual organisms, their similarities, and in terms of ecosystem and, and uh, societal levels, there are also similarities. And this is a starting point for understanding the human evolution. There are two major lines of evidence for human evolution. That is, two sources, independent sources of data on human evolution. And when we put the two together, we can develop some very powerful and sustainable insights. The first are comparative studies, and this includes DNA, protein sequences, comparisons of anatomy, including embryology, homologous structures, vestigial organs, we can compare across the order primates as well as compare within any order, within any particular set of species or families. <clears throat> the second set of data, or second line of data, are the fossil records. And there are abundant fossils, including a large number of fossils for early pre-human ancestors. And these can then be contextualized by the geological data. And of that, we have both relative data as well as absolute data. And this allows us to put a fairly good grasp on when that fossil lived, when it was a living organism. And the comparative anatomy allows us to compare the anatomy of that fossil with the anatomy of living, contemporary living organisms. The first set of evidence that we have for human evolution is the genetic evidence. This is comparative data that we can make between species. And here in the diagram on the right, you can see that we have listed monkeys, gibbons, great apes, and humans. And we can look at the endogenous retroviruses, the ERBs, that are shared as well as differentiated between monkeys, gibbons, great apes, and humans. And what we see is that humans contain a variety of ERBs, but ERB5 is only found in humans. ERB4 is found in great apes and humans. ERB3 is found in gibbons, great apes, and humans. And ERB1 is found in monkeys, gibbons, humans, and great apes. But ERB2, which occurred after the divergence of monkeys from the lesser apes, gibbons, they're the only ones that have ERB2. So what this tells us is that there's a common ancestor that passed on this, the first endogenous viral elements into the genomes of these um, animals. And that the, these endogenous viral elements are derived from the retroviruses and have played a role in shaping the genomes of these species. And so humans are a little bit different than other species. We also are able to look at the genomes of hemoglobin, of haptoglobin, of many other common proteins that are shared between ourselves and great apes and see the similarities. This is not random. This is not an act of chance. This is by design. From the genetic studies, the molecular genetic studies, we are able to develop a tree that depicts the relationship between humans, chimpanzees, and bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, lesser apes, old world monkeys, new world monkeys, tarsers, and lemurs, and lorises. And as you can see, the, the time span would suggest that our closest biological relatives, in terms of our anatomy and physiology, are the chimpanzees and bonobos. 
the last common ancestor of human and chimpanzees lived between eight and six million years ago. We don't have its remains yet, but we're searching. And what we have are the remains of something that came just before that and then many ancestors that came after that. The second very powerful set of evidence for human evolution comes from the fossil record. And from the fossils, we have extensive human remains <coughs> that document the presence of pre-human ancestors or pre-human individuals, which we presume are ancestors to the modern human. And they also help give us a timeline for the modern human. Uh, and for these ancestors so that we get a sense of the geological context within which these fossils exist. These fossils have been found all over the world, but of particular relevance is Africa, which seems to be the homeland of our genus Homo. The geological evidence for human evolution is depicted in this slide. And as you see on your right, these are more recent times, and then as we move to the left, we go back in time. Homo sapiens, our species, has only been around a fairly short time. Prior to that, we had Homo neanderthalensis, which we have some evidence that Neanderthals and humans, modern humans, probably interacted and shared genes. Homo heidelbergensis, also some evidence of shared genes in homo sapien populations. Homo ergaster was the, the, the first real concrete evidence of our genus, homo. And outside of Africa, homo ergaster became homo erectus and lived for a very long time. We move back in time to Homo habilis and the Australopithecines, such as Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus scari, first known tool maker, Australopithecus acarensis, which you probably know as Lucy, and uh, her kind. And by that time, we are at almost four million years when afarensis exists. Then before the Australopithecus afarensis species, you get Australopithecus amnensis and Artipithecus ramidus. And that pretty much rounds out the hominids, and that is the human-like creatures that have existed on this planet. We have older finds of Sophilanthropus at seven million years, uh, but since that predates the separation of the ancestors of modern humans and the ancestors of modern chimpanzees and bonobos. We're not sure if that's an ancestor of the chimps and bonobos or an ancestor of humans. In fact, we don't know if any of these are direct ancestors, except for the Neanderthals. We know that we, because we can look at their genomes and that we carry, some of us carry, some portion of our genome is derived from the Neanderthals. But this is the time frame within which we are working. The species that are closest to the origin of the genus Homo, because we are Homo sapiens, so we're one of the, the species that are closest to the genus Homo are the pre-erectus Homo found in Kobe Fora, Kenya, and then Homo erectus found in uh, Demasi, Georgia, in Kobe Fora, in Kenya, found in Ethiopia. In fact, the oldest uh, Homo erectus, Homo ergaster remains are in Africa. And it's out of Africa that we get migrations to the rest of the world and subsequent diversification. The variation that we see in modern humans is evolutionarily <coughs> very recent. From a taxonomic, systematics, and phylogenetic perspective, we are all the same species, Homo sapiens. 
We're back to the same subspecies. We are Homo sapiens sapiens. That means that all the diversity that we see among us is below the subspecies level, below the variant level. It's minor. All modern humans share a common ancestor. This is affirmed by both the genetic record of comparative genetics and DNA, comparative proteomics, anatomy, comparative anatomy, as well as the fossil record. The fossil record points to a single origin out of Africa for human males and human females with migrations of some subset of humans out of Africa. And the diversity within Africa is greater than all of the diversity in the rest of the world. The bottom line in terms of the scientific evidence for human evolution, it suggests that human beings developed from earlier species of animals, that there's continuity both genetically, anatomically, behaviorally, and that human history and prehistory for the largest part has been lived as gatherers and hunters. And that's the template upon which our modern behavior has had to adapt and build. All modern humans share a common ancestry within the recent evolutionary past. And what that means is that we truly are brothers and sisters to each other. This is my last slide. Evolution, we have the fossils, we have the DNA, we have the comparative anatomy, we have the geological framework. Dobzhansky, who was a very famous evolutionary biologist, said that nothing in biology makes sense outside of the context of evolution. Adnan Najib, a PhD from San Diego, has said that a comprehensive reading of the Quran and the prophetic teachings with, and this is the important part, interpretive latitude, it does not restrict the interpretation of human creation to an evolutionary one. In other words, the interpretation of Islamic insights can be informed by modern science because we must remember, brothers and sisters and honored guests, that Allah has ultimately offered everything science can ascertain. Our duty as scientists is to explore Allah's creation, try to understand it within the humble and interpretive latitude of the Quran and the prophetic teachings. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you insights on the science of human evolution. <coughs> so thank you very much. And I will convey a uh, salam and thanks uh, to Dr. Jackson. And I speak to her again, inshallah. We're very grateful for her for preparing this presentation for us, in spite of her not being able to attend in person. Um, uh, if we could turn the lights back on, inshallah, we will be able to start uh, our panel discussion, question and answer session. Um, we also want to express our appreciation for one more person who is not here, and we hope to have her connected, but not, and that is Dr. Rana Al-Dajani. Uh, Dr. Rana Al-Dajani is a biologist who teaches at Hashemite University in uh, the country of Jordan. And I, um, if you were here during the, uh, the uh, period between the last session and this session, uh, we did have a video of uh, her, one of her presentations. Um, uh, we uh, had thought that since Dr. Jackson uh, could not be here that we would have her in the panel session and she very kindly agreed with that but the technology, uh, we were not the best technologists here unfortunately, perhaps we are better biologists than technologists uh, here so um, that did not work out but I do want to express our appreciation to her uh, for being uh, offering to be available. Uh,
so we do have Dr. Abu Haif, and I think um, uh, Dr. Abu Haif, we have you on the spot now. Uh, this is uh, where we get to ask all the tough questions related to evolutionary biology and um, the, the evolution of human beings. So the, so the amazing thing is not that we descended from monkey, which is not the truth, but that in fact we share common answers to the all living things, the simplest living forms included. Um, so um, I, I, we, we do have uh, another session that follows this. Um, uh, and so we need to um, wrap up in a timely manner. Um, and so we we'll want to keep questions uh, very brief, please. And um, hopefully, Dr. Wuhef will be able to answer them uh, today. Sure. Can you repeat the website to get Islamic science? Uh, it's I'll put it up uh, just at the end so we can see it. Okay. Um, so, um, questions? I'm going to ask uh, you to be brief, please. Yes, the sister in White's please. So, I get that evolution is not in conflict with the Quran, but how do you fit in Adam and Eve with the context of evolution? Can you repeat that? Yes. Can you repeat well, this was, uh, this was um, something I hoped that Fatima Jackson would, uh, <laughs> would have uh, addressed, because she would be obviously someone to address this. Um, uh, I think the, the, we have to think, I'm going to stand up just because I can, I, I do this, I, you know, I talk on the phone, my mom always gets me upset, she always gets upset because I'm always walking and talking, so it's part of my habit. So, um, this is uh, probably the crucial question, uh, but I think we have to think about um, Adam, the evolution of Adam, not as a, um, necessarily in terms of biology, but necessarily maybe in terms of the soul. There are passages in the Quran that talk, um, the talk uh, that say that Allah And so the question becomes when did Adam actually come to be? And as you saw, Dr. Fatima Jackson had a number of um, species of humans. Um, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Arpithecus. The question is not necessarily biological in nature, but the idea is at what point in time during this evolution did we become human in terms of Quranic terms? When we were able to actually um, understand that Allah exists. To me, this is kind of the crucial point. It is a, is a question of we're just only at the beginning of trying to understand in terms of neuroscience, in terms of language, in terms of biology. At what point did Allah blow into us our soul so that we could actually understand the existence of Allah? And perhaps this might be a point where Adam came to be. And I think the point is more that it may not be necessarily a, bi a biological event, a biological phenomena, but more a both a biological and a spiritual event that happened to them. Okay, assistance, let's go. Okay, so with that being sort of the Arab plan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings out the descendants of Adam and asks them on an angry book. Okay, and we all say yes. So we knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was on board at that point. So, yeah, where does that fit in? And was that a literal event, a spiritual event? What kind of event was that? Well, I mean, I think these are the questions we need to be asking. I don't have the answers. The answers need to be studied from this perspective, knowing what we know about human biological evolution, and knowing what we know about the Quran, and events in the Quran, and passages in the Quran, how do we interpret those so that together we can make some sense of these events, these passages, and, and the, the timing of when this might have come together. I think actually it's interesting that Quranic ayat are more in line with very, very recent evolutionary theory in that there are ayat uh, that speak of uh, there are many generations of humans before you, before Adam, and then Adam being the final creation. And I don't know if it would be wrong to interpret it in that way, but that would seem to be what 
and that is more consistent with evolutionary biology now than it used to be when the Darwinism came out that we were descended from monkeys. I think it's interesting that the Quran actually has a better, more correct interpretation. Well, you see, we, I mean, if, if you want to look at it that way, that's the way to look at the IAF that has been looked at before. See, I guess the thing is, um, uh, the idea that we came from monkeys was never part of Darwinism. It was simply something that was misinterpreted later on. So that was never part of Darwinism or even what Darwin had said. Um, but, um, but yes, I mean, there are many, you know, I like to think of there are many consistencies. Now, there are passages in the Quran, I'm sure many of you have it on your mind, where Allah says, you know, kun fayakun. You know, this kind of, you know, where I, I, I created Adam with my own two hands. Right? This is, uh, there are passages in the Quran that talk about Adam in this way that might give us this idea that it was an instantaneous event. But for example, Ibn Arabi talks about, you know, in the passage where he talks about creating Adam with his own two hands, uh, he, he interpreted that as, you know, the right hand, or maybe two right hands, if we're talking about, you know, or one right hand being a spiritual and one biological. Also, he refers to, uh, in the one surah just before, Surah Yasin, he talks about creating cattle with his own two hands. And so it's not necessarily just humans that he created with his own two hands. So it's not a literal event. It's not, I mean, that we know as much. It's not something that is instantaneous or literal. But there are many other passages that suggest that it was some kind of step-like fashion, and that is consistent. Speaking as, a, as an engineer, the Quran also points to the creation of ships by Allah. And it's obviously, you know, the process, right, of creation of ships. So, question over So, I guess my question is, are we still evolving? We have these records of species that have lived in the past, but so are we going to have more species? Are we still evolving, or is that the evolution? So let me tell you this, the single greatest change in human history that has happened is in the last 50 years is human size. In the last 50 years, in North America alone in Europe, we have grown more than three to four inches in size. Okay? And that has to do, of course, with technologies, uh, food, domestication, and advances in medicine. But we have grown a tremendous amount. If you look at the charts of our growth, I mean, we've actually changed it. If you look, even, I mean, everybody kind of knows it when you go to Europe and you see those small little short doors, right? Those were for just humans just even 50 years ago. So we are continually evolving. And I think that message alone is key for understanding medicine. Because we are continually evolving, we have to accept that, understand that, and that's a key to understanding how we're changing. Yes. Yes. I have read uh, an article in a small publication many years ago, written by a Muslim scholar from Yugoslavia at the time. He make a very good statement that human being has been developed biologically like evolution theory. But when the message came to be the vice surgeon or Khalifa, that is a different story. And this is a Muslim scholar. He said in the history also, it shows there is a sudden change. Maybe that is the change when you will be careful. So his scholar from Yugoslavia at the time is written by Islam in Islam publication. Maybe 25 years ago. So again, I think that shows the nature of the question is still an open question. We need people to get involved, to do research, to understand, to question, to put forth. Absolutely. Yes. Next so I, I just want to thank you. I think it would really uh, shed a great deal on this area. And, and um, uh, I, I just wanted to see uh, is, is that uh, in the first question is that do you have uh, your research have um, received any criticism from outside in the